We're joined on INSEAD Knowledge at the European Business Summit uh, here in Brussels by Nani Bakali Falcao, your President and CEO of G International, which is essentially the, the non-US operations. That's right. Uh, you've been taking part in a, a session here um, on protectionism. What's your view of protectionism first? Protectionism is not a new word. Protectionism has always existed around the world. There are several different examples. They go from uh, the kind of specification that you need to have to introduce a product in Japan, for instance, to some particular barriers, for custom barriers that can be in certain countries. Uh, so it's nothing new that we have to deal with. It is, of course, becoming a, a, a word, a common word nowadays, because of the crisis we're going through. And because there is a tremendous fear from inside some of the major economies, and not only the major economies, that lots of jobs are going to be lost. And so, consequently, that there is going to be an impoverishment of the country. Now, I don't think that protection is, is the right answer. We have never seen, you know, I am a history buff, I like to read about history, and, and, uh, and so I use it as master of life. We have never seen in history countries that had a particular protectionist policy being successful. Talk about the response that the governments gave in 1929-1930, which was a protectionist response and brought everybody into the depression which is a bad example. You talk about Russia during the communist times, was not an expansionary economy, it was highly protected. You talk about India before 1991 and 1992, where there were some very high import duties, and it is only through a liberalization of that economy that that economy started growing at an average of 7% per year, slowed down a little bit this year, but 7% per year, and brought several million people from the poverty that they were in into a middle class kind of condition. Think about uh, Brazil, for instance, in Latin America, where only until a few years ago, uh, pre-Lula, there was a very protectionistic environment. I remember having lunch, for instance, with one of the big bankers of Brazil. I'm talking to about 1997, 1998 and he was really trying to tell me convinced how protecting the economy of Brazil was a good thing and I was trying to explain him that that was really not the case that if Brazil would have opened up the barriers to the world it would have been much better so protection is not the answer and I think that uh, Mr. Lamy uh, the head of the WTO during this panel I participated to made a very interesting point that it was we need to trade ourselves out of this crisis we're in and i think it is really the best answer that there is it's, it's very difficult though to <coughs> give that exp that argument explain that argument to say workers in the us who are yeah. who are facing yeah. the loss of jobs yeah. here you have the conflicting situation between what is good from an economic point of view and what seems to be good from a political point of view. But I would say that because of the slowdown, because of the economic crisis, because of the slowdown, there is no question about the fact that there is going to be a price, that, an unfortunate price that needs to be paid, which is that people are going to be without a job for a certain period of time. Um, it's a dramatic situation, it's not it's something nobody really wants, but it is unfortunately the price that is paid because we had 20 years of very strong expansionary economy. If you think about it in the period of time between 1982, which was the beginning of the Reagan administration crisis, economic crisis, until 2007, the, the, the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, we had 20 years of real expansion. They were interrupted by two war crises which was 91, 2001, but we knew why this crisis came about and they were quick and sharp to come back. Um, there were some local crises during this period of time, but generally you can look at the world during this period of time in a very expansionary way, which was driven mostly by 
the new technologies that were introduced. We are talking about the internet, productivity brought in by the internet, we are talking about the telecommunication and so on, and by the fact that there was a large, a strong push in the globalization, where we opened new markets, where we brought millions and millions of people, as I said before, from the stage of poverty to the stage of middle class, so they became customers. Think only about what happened in China and India, just, just, just to make an example. So we had 20 years of incredible growth. We had some excesses during these 20 years of, of incredible growth. Um, I would say that also some of the governance was not the one that we would have liked it to be, particularly in some of the financial transactions. And so now we are paying the price for these mistakes. But I'm an eternal optimist. And I think that, you know, now everybody's talking about the crisis because we're in the crisis, but the crisis is going to finish, it's going to go away, and another period of expansion is going to, is going to come. And you were saying for something like uh, 20 years, a 20 year growth period, which was pretty optimistic. I, I, I'm using the 20 years before and I hope that it's going to be 20 years after. Might not be 20 years, but we are going to take the normal economic cycles the way that they are. But given the, uh, the deep crisis that we're in at the moment and uh, the, you know, the financial banking implications, um, how is GE approaching this particular crisis? But what we are doing is really, you can articulate it on four important points. The first point is we are really trying to do as much as possible to keep the company safe. In a moment like this one, keeping the company safe, it means to be able to have the amount of cash that is necessary to run all our operations, particularly our financial, our financial services. To keep the company safe means also to continue to have a, 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 a very, very strong attention on the level of integrity because, you know, it took a lot of people 130 years to build, the, the, to build the, the culture of this company, to build the image of this company. It can take very few people, in a moment like this one, it can take very few people a very short period of time to ruin and destroy everything completely. So keeping the company safe is really the first one. Performance is going to be very important. Performance is always important, no matter what. But particularly in a moment like this one where you need to really set clear priorities, you need to, you need to have very clear programs, you need to have strong and solid objectives, and, and you need to meet those objectives. I mean, the performance is becoming more and more important. The third point is the one of continuing to invest for the future, because there is going to be a future. And continuing to invest for the future, it means to take very good care of the customers, which is the most important constituency. It means to continue to invest in technology, because this is what is going to drive the growth in the future. And it means to continue to invest in the globalization, because the markets are evolving, the markets are changing. And you know, it's not this crisis that is going to reduce the capability of China to be a big market, reduce the capabilities of India to be a big market, or the Middle East and Africa. So, we need to continue in the globalization. And the fourth point, which is extremely important, is an internal point, if you want, but it's extremely important, is the one of keeping the people motivated, is the one of, of you know, giving to our own people the clear vision, the clear communication, stating where we are going. Don't hide anything. You know, be open, candid, and honest about the difficulties but give the directions that we are going to. So motivation, communication and so on are really fundamental in a moment like this one. But some of, the, some of these issues have been uh, presumably in the G, G DNA for quite a long time, the issues of integrity, uh, the long-term vision, the investing. <coughs> what, what, what specifically is G? I would, I would say that there is really nothing, well, there is one thing specifically we are doing which is different from the past. In a moment like this one, the cooperation with the institutions, in the broad sense of the word, the governments, the agencies, the people that in one way or the other from a public point of view have influence on our future, that cooperation becomes extremely important. We are coming out of a period of time when really we could have very good business without worrying too much about the governments and the government's activities. Today there is going to be more regulation and we need to deal with that. It's not a bad thing as long as everybody plays at the same level. 
And there, are, there is going to be a lot of money which is pumped by the governments into the economies. You know, we are talking about something between two to three trillion dollars in the world that is, that is in the process of being pumped in order to stimulate the economies. And a lot of this money is going to go into the build-up of the infrastructure, uh, perfecting the financial systems and so on, all areas where we are particularly strong. We are a company that provides infrastructure. Think about power generation, think about water, think about healthcare and so on. And we are a strong financial service company. So I would say the difference that there is, you know, the four important points we said before, but the difference that there is, it is the intensified effort, and we have a special task force for that, a big task force, the intensified effort to work with governments and institutions. Many of the uh, points that uh, you've raised in this interview, um, you, you've been evoking the long-term aspects, uh, long-term investments and so on. Um, GE has taken, um, in the short term, quite a major hit recently. In terms of its share price, I mean, your share price is off something like 70% uh, from uh, a year ago. Um, how do you deal with the short-term aspects, uh, the, the, the loss of your AAA rating and so on, um, and the share price, and yet try to keep an eye firmly on the long term? Look, we are a very big corporation. We have resources, and that's probably and that's our luck. We are not special people, but we are a company that is provided with many, many resources. There are two things that we have to talk about. One of them is the market, the Wall Street, the share market, and the other one is the performance of the company. As far as Wall Street is concerned, I think that we have been caught into the storm of most of the companies that are quoted in any kind of in any kind of market. And that's essentially through GE Capital and the losses well, there. Well, this is the, the, the market has been going down and we have been going down together with the market and I think that people had some questions about the capability of GE Capital to perform and an underlying perform. Now, on the other side, what can we do? Nothing else but perform. So we can work to be productive, we can work to generate the net income that is necessary for our company to be a successful and, and good company. You know, people talk about GE Capital, but think about it. In 2008, a disastrous year for the financial service, for the financial world, GE Capital made $8.6 billion of net income. It was the most profitable financial company that there is in the world. We are not going to have the same performance in 2009 because the financial world around us has eroded, but I believe that we are still going to turn a pretty decent performance which is going to be better than anybody else. So all these doubts about GE Capital, you know, people have got the right to their own opinions and, and we are not going to challenge it. But on the other side, I am sure that through performance we will be able to dispel all the doubts that there are and you will see that our shares are going to go back to, to where the shares belong. So just in short, um, how long do you think this uh, particular crisis will last? Are we going to get out of it by the end of the year? As, Look, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, if I would be able to give you an answer on that, I probably would make a ton of money doing something completely different from what I'm doing. Um, on the other side, let's look at it. The first quarter of 2009 is very bad. I don't think that the second quarter is going to be better. Okay? I think it's going to be still a difficult quarter. However, today, the 26th of March of 2009, we see some glimmers of hope. And let me just list some of them. The Japanese auto industry is beginning to build cars again because they discovered that the inventories are low. The Chinese purchasing index has been growing for the last three months, which is a reverse the trend that was a declining trend for a long period of time. The price of oil and commodities is going to go up, which, you know, for some is good news, for some is bad news, but it's going to give money to the people in the developing, in the, in the commodity-rich countries that are going to be able to reinvest that money 
and so trading, building up trade. The Baltic index, which is the index of goods that are floating on, on the water at any given time, which from the peak of, I think it was August of 2008, had declined, uh, declined by 70%, has been growing for the last three months. The housing start in the United States for the month of February was 20% up. Okay, you're talking about 20% out of very little, but it was 20% up. The banking system in continental Europe, not in the UK, but in continental Europe, is, it might turn out a reasonable first quarter. Not a great first quarter, but a reasonable first quarter because missing the US competition and the UK competition and uh, being able to, to charge some high interest rates, they are basically rebuilding the profitability of the financial institutions. And there are some other glimmers of hope. So not everything is pointing down like it was in the fourth quarter of 2008. Again, first quarter bad, second quarter bad, some glimmers of hope which if like little flowers in springtime can be nurtured and can be made grow, might maybe flatten up the performance in the second half and so we might look at a 2010 which might start again the, 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 the economy, the growth around the world. Hoping that there is no other major disaster which we don't know yet, okay, but hoping that there is no other major disaster happening in the world. There could be, you know, something like a terroristic attack or something like that, I mean, but hopefully not. Which has been part of the problem up to now, has been the uh, level of uncertainty, but um, the depth of the, uh, the, the banking issues and so on. Yeah, but what I'm saying, I'm saying that there has been a, a level of uncertainty and some of these elements of uncertainty in this moment are being slightly corrected. Now, don't, 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 I'm not selling you that there is a recovery, okay? I just speak about glimmers of hope, which is glimmers of hope. <laughs> and I, I think there'll probably be a number of people watching this who hope that you're right in, uh, in those glimmers of hope becoming reality. Nani Bakali Foucault, President and CEO of G International, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for being here.